disruptive leadership intensive for the next five weeks is going to be exactly that. It's going to be extremely intensive and it's going to be uh, a lot of information that we're going to try to disseminate and download into your minds and your hearts and your spirit. And we are in hopes that it's going to make you a much better effective, productive leader, particularly in this season. I have made this statement on several occasions and I will make it again. I believe in my humble opinion that crisis causes real, emer real leadership to emerge. Chaos causes real leadership to emerge. If you wanna find out uh, the attributes of a great leader, in my humble opinion, is when they rise to the top in some unprecedented times and in, in unprecedented uh, spaces uh, when they can pioneer and navigate and when they can disrupt the marginalized thinkers. I believe that is the marks of effective, powerful, disruptive leadership. Now, of course, uh, Dr. Doreen uh, Escobar has done extensive research and writing on the subject. Uh, so uh, she has uh, uh, so uh, competently and professionally and academically been able to synthesize the academic along with uh, the biblical and she also has learned how to uh, make this as, as secular and corporate as possible. So you want to get a, a good balance of the secular along with what we would consider maybe the spiritual space. But uh, that's, of course, is going to be built from the construct of the Bible. But there's going to be some other extra biblical writings and readings that we're going to encourage you uh, to put into your library. Now, with that being said, these sessions we're trying to keep at an hour and 15 minutes. It's going to be a lot of information uh, that you're going to be seeing and receiving and we're going to be sharing. Don't allow that to overwhelm you um, because we can always go at, at a different pace, but it is my endeavor that uh, Doreen and myself can download as much of this information over a five week period as possible. All right, so with that being said, you see our first slide, disruptive leadership. Let me just open up with prayer uh, and then we we'll get into uh, the presentation, all right? Now, if you have any questions, please go to the private chat. This is an interactive session, much like uh, the session me and Tracy has been doing. This is interactive. I would like it to be as interactive as possible. Now, with that being said, uh, the more you respond, the more you get involved, the more it may slow down the process of us getting you all of the information that has been prepared. But I would prefer uh, you be uh, actively engaged in what we're teaching and what we're sharing than you just uh, sitting there in your home like we're lecturing you. So I want you to feel free to go to your chat and you can interact. If you have a question, you can probably raise your hand. And then Frankie, of course, who's the engineer, can unmute you. And if you would like to talk, you could. Uh, but I'm going to, of course, be directing the traffic so that doesn't get out of control. Uh, so let's get started uh, with prayer, and then we'll start vetting through this material on this morning. Lord, we thank you again for waking us up early this morning. Some of us highly fatigued. Some of us highly tired. Some of us highly challenged. God, you are going to get the glory out of it all, and we thank you in advance for giving us the mental capacity and the cognitive skill to receive and to digest all of this information. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> 
Amen. All right. Now, before we start moving through, uh, Doreen, introduce yourself so they can hear your voice so they don't think the pastor is going to be doing all the talking. Uh, say morning. something to the people. Good morning, all. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Just really quickly, a quick background from a academic as well as corporate setting. I work in the learning and development field. I deal with leadership development. And so this particular topic is close to my heart. I love empowering people, giving them the information that they need so that they can be successful in their respective areas. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to use this definitely within ministry, but if you're in the corporate setting, wherever you may be, you can use the information that we're sharing over the next five weeks and really think about what disruptive leadership entails and the part that you can play in being a disruptive leader. All right, let's get started. Now, when we start thinking about disruptive leadership, we're basically talking about looking at how to come up with new processes and new solutions. Don't be the problem, be the solution to the problem. Uh, don't be an embittered leader, be a leader that is uh, involved in causing the organization, uh, whatever aspect of the organization you work in to make it better. Now, of course, being disruptive mean uh, not allowing it to be stagnant or to stale, but being a part of the process of evolution, causing it to expand, to grow, and to be much better. So let's look at, let's look at the areas that I want us, me and Doreen, to touch over the next five weeks, all right? Uh, these are the areas that we're going to be touching over the next five weeks. We're going to be looking at, uh, of course, leadership, and we're going to be defining that and drilling down into that. We're going to talk about disruption, and because when you think about leadership and disruption, it almost seems to be a little bit oxymoronic. It can be almost be paradoxical because when in, in most of our leadership settings, particularly church, we, we would look at leadership for more of a position of submitting to the directions of another. But in this concept, uh, disruption is, is, is not submission and disruption is not also chaotic. It is, as in John Lewis's words, uh, creating good trouble, okay? Yes. Good trouble. So we're gonna look at leadership, disruption, hegemony. We're gonna look at colonial and post-colonialism, uh, biblical and worldviews, marginalization, democratization, a systemic injustice and liberation. These are all of the areas over the next five weeks that we're looking at making sure that we can cover. All right, next slide. Okay, leadership. We want this, today's session is getting you a better understanding of leadership. What is leadership? What is the posture of leadership? What is the character of leadership? What is the disposition of leadership? We want to drill into that leadership. Are you a leader? Are you an emerging leader? Or maybe you're a follower, uh, or your followership is stronger than your leadership. But even being a follower, you will find that you do have some level of influence, even as you create the, the climate for people to line up behind you uh, as a follower. All right, so we're gonna talk about that. Next slide. Okay, there's a great man theory and this, it is stated leaders are born, not made. Leaders are born, not made. Now, I want you to really think about that statement. Leaders are born, not made. Because I believe 
in my humble opinion, that leaders can be made even if they're not born with the, the, the what you call it, the traits of leadership. I believe that leadership can be in someone's DNA. It can be in someone's mitochondria. I believe that some people innately just have the ability to influence others. But there are another set of individuals that may not innately have the DNA, but they do have the skill set and they can be taught, they can be trained on how to be an effective leader. So consider that statement. Leaders are born, not made. Leaders are born, not made. You don't have to agree with the great man theory. You don't have to agree with that. You may, you may feel that, well, Bishop, I don't have a long list of people in my family. I don't come from that lineage or that background where people in my family led. I'm the first emerging leader in my family. And I was taught leadership. Uh, I was trained to be a leader. Someone mentored me. They poured into me. So this statement does not have to necessarily be one that you agree with. But it is one that I want you to strongly consider. Leaders are born, not made. All right? Next slide. If, if I might just chime in a little about that theory, it really does look at different um, icons in our, our communities and our societies. And we look at the attributes of, say, a Martin Luther King, a John Lewis, a Coretta Scott King, whomever it may be. We look at those attributes of what makes them stand out and why they are iconic to us. That's really the premise for the great man theory. Okay, leadership. When we think about leadership, I want you to write down in your own words, what do you see leadership as? Now, please do your best to stay from your generic meanings. Uh, come up with an in-depth working definition <laughs> of leadership. Don't be smart. Oh, leadership is influence. We know leadership is influence. But uh, just to digress on something that Dr. Escobar said, that we look at certain people as being iconic in their leadership. Uh, LeBron James, people see him as an iconic leader. Uh, she said Martin Luther King Jr., but I'll say someone who just transitioned. Let's say John Lewis. They see John Lewis as a leader. You may see a, a professor or an instructor or teacher as a leader. I know that sounds crazy, but you can. You may see someone in a, a secular uh, uh, venue who may not be called the CEO or the top level manager, but they influence and they lead within the sphere of where they work at. That's also leadership. So how do you define leadership? You need to have a working definition yourself on how you define leadership, all right? Let's look at the next slide. Okay, now this is how North House defined leadership, is a process whereby an individual can influence a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. That's no house definition of leadership. And I think this is probably the most common definition. What do you say, Doreen? It definitely is. It's the foundation, particularly in the, Scott, in the academic world, that everyone gravitates to because we do seek to find different definitions for it. In fact, there's over 200 definitions for leadership. And if you did a Google search today on leadership, you would probably come up with 
a billion different um, insights on leadership. But ultimately, it's a process that you go through so that you're gathering individuals and followers to help you reach a common goal. As um, Thomas Aquinas said, for the betterment of everyone, for the common good of all. When, now, when I look at this word, um, of this, this working definition by No House of Leadership, and again, like Doreen so eloquently said it, this is more of an academic uh, definition of leadership, a process whereby an individual can influence a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. This is also, uh, <laughs> if I looked at it from more of a church perspective, this yeah. can also be uh, <laughs> witchcraft. <laughs> I ain't gonna mess with y'all this morning. It almost could be like witchcraft. Uh, a lot of people have influence over others in a very negative, impactful way. So, you're, this could be uh, 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 negative, but we're trying to say it is positive because ultimately a good leader who knows how to submit our lineup under proper authority is only going to influence the group or individuals for the common goal, good of the whole company. Exactly. All right. Exactly. And then, you know, Bishop, when you think about leadership, right? Mm -hmm. um, Henry Nguyen, he talked about, he had a, wrote a book and he talked about the temptations of Christ. And when you look at Luke, Jesus went into the wilderness and was tempted. He talks about the temptation of relevance, the temptation of being popular, the temptation of power, and what that looks like and how leaders have, have to really be aware of that temptation. And so you focus on whatever decision you make, whatever you're doing, whatever influence you have, how does it work for the betterment of society, of community, of That's ministry? Right. That's what you focus on. Those are the things that you have to be aware of. Those are the caveats, right? Popularity, power, and relevance. You want to stay away from that. It shows you, you know, he says you go from, from relevance to prayer. God, what is it that you want me to do? You go from popularity to ministry. God, how do you want me to minister? How do you want me to serve your people? And then you go from power of leading to being led by the Holy Spirit, to being led by God and what it is that God wants you to do in this season as either an emerging leader or as a current leader. What does that look like for you? What, when, when, when Doreen talks about being led, of course, by the Holy Spirit, this, this we put this in the matrix or the premise, uh, I'll say the prism of, what we do is in terms of church, but in a secular sense, it's, it's, it works the same way. Yes. And not be divisive. Uh, disruptive leadership does not mean you are divisive in that you are so opinionated that you're negative. Real leadership is not divisive, neither is it negative. Now we're gonna use uh, so we see, I, I knew, me and Doreen knew we weren't going to kind of get stuck right here. We knew that when we started. But when I look at this, 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 this statement here, a process whereby an individual can influence a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. When I look at that from the biblical sense, from the negative perspective, I look at Aaron and I look at Miriam, two leaders that the people look to. They, of course, Moses was the leader, but these were servant leaders to Moses. And they influenced the nation greatly, even though the people wanted to do something. Well, uh, where's Moses at? Let's get us a, a calf. Aaron and Miriam did not have to 
conform to that because they had ultimate influence. But because they did not exercise their influence, the people influenced them. Uh, here's another example. When uh, 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 Aaron and Moses looked, Aaron and Miriam rather, looked at Moses, they were, they were somewhat, uh, I want to use the word, they were jealous of him. They were intimidated with him. How can you say that? Because this is the statement that they made. They said, are you the only one? Moses, are you the only one that got vision? Are you the only one that have a voice? Are you the only one that have an opinion? We want our voices to be heard too. And the Bible says they then murmured amongst themselves. They started complaining. Then they, that complaint went out to the people to the point where God was angry with them. So as a leader, as a leader, knowing you have influence, you cannot allow that influence to cause a chasm, a breach, a disconnect. You cannot cause it to incite. We want disruption, but we don't want that level of disruption to incite negativity. All right. Next slide, Doreen. So before we, before we go, um, the scripture reference for this, Bishop, when we talk about a leader, the first leader example that we have, of course, is God. Yes, we're right. pulling from Genesis 1, 26 through 28, where God said, let us make humankind in our own image. He gives the example of being the first leader we know our leader, our God, our King, but also enables us. He gives us the ability to be co-partners with him in the leadership process. And so that's the foundation. It doesn't really, there's no scripture um, that really talks about God as, as a leader and using the language, but we know that he is. And he's the example of a good influencer of the ability to make in, uh, make decisions of transformation, of innovation. He gives us the framework and the model from which to draw insight. And I personally use that even in my secular setting. God is, I'm a Christian leader in a corporate setting. I take it everywhere I go. And that's what guides me through this process. Now, what Doreen said, I want you to make note of that because she's totally correct. We don't find anywhere in the scriptures where it is clearly defined that God was a leader, but it is implied. Right. It's implied by how he created Adam to rule, to have dominion, to have authority. So we see in Adam, the attributes of God. And if, if, if God created Adam in his image and after his likeness, then we can see that Adam was certainly a leader. Well, some people will say, well, that, that, that can be a somewhat conjecture because he, uh, he followed Eve. He did not follow Eve. He acquiesced to her request but that doesn't mean he followed her. He acquiesced. They were supposed to be in partnership. When God gave Adam this uh, woman called Eve, it was not for her to be under him. It was not for her to be over him, but they were supposed to walk side by side in partnership. So what all Adam did, again, was show great leadership skills by giving her voice to express herself. Anytime you have great leadership, they give you the space to land with your voice. They give you the space to, uh, you know, express yourself. They give you the space to um, give you, uh, share their ideas and their concepts. And uh, here's another great example, though, of, of Eve having tremendous influence. Yes. She had great influence to get Adam to do what God told him not to do. Uh, she had tremendous influence, 
and he was not deceived. So Doreen is right. He was not deceived. Adam was never deceived. She was deceived, but Adam was never deceived. He acquiesced. He bent his will to her request. She had that level of influence. So if they were created in the image, in the likeness of God, that means God put inside of them influence. Yes. God put inside of them the ability to impact others with disposition, with behavior. And, 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 and I'm glad Doreen said that because I don't think many times we look at the construct of, of the attributes of God as leadership, but it is. God does not make us do anything. That free he influences will. us to do things through the free Holy will. Spirit, but he's yet he allows you to make your own choice. But hopefully, because of God's character, that's powerful, his disposition, that influences you to embrace God. So God is the great influencer. So I want to put a pin right there. She's totally correct. It is not clearly expressed, but it is implied through creation that, that God was the first leader. One of the things that I'm like you, I love St. Augustine. He says something in the city of God in one of his books. He says, the devil then would not have ensnared man in the open and manifest sin of doing what God had forbidden had man not already begun to live for himself. He goes on to say, it was this that made him listen with pleasure to the words, you shall be like God. And that's, you know, where we, we, we are in the image of God, but we have to be so cautious, right? And how we can get ensnared, again, going back to that paradox of power. You know, you really, as a leader, you always have to self-assess. What are my motives? Why am I doing this? You know, um, am, am I being a servant? Or if is, is it transactional where it's self-gaining? We'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I want you to write down something Doreen just said. Write it down, it's very important. She talked about the paradox of power. That's very important as a leader, the paradox of power. How are you executing your authority? How are you using your authority and your power? Very powerful. Don't, don't, don't miss that. When she said that, you, need, you should have wrote that down. It's very interesting. Paradox of power. And we'll drill, I'm sure we'll drill more into that as the weeks progress. But that's a very important point when you start talking about influence, leadership, uh, achieving goals together as a group. Yes. Paradox of power, uh, your ego, be, being ego driven. Are you ego driven? Are you narcissistic? Paradox of power. Does power give you? A significance and value because real leaders don't need power in order to feel important or significant yes. or value. They get their value in seeing goals accomplished. Yes. That's, that's, that's the ultimate uh, 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 joy of fulfillment, better word a better fulfillment of accomplishment of a leader is when they see the common goals being achieved, not their individual desires and agendas. That falls under the paradox of power. Don't, don't lose that. Don't miss that. We could do a whole five weeks on that alone. Yes. The paradox of power. That's very interesting. I didn't know she was going to throw that out there like that on y'all so fast. <laughs> she put it out there on y'all so fast. I had to, I had to slow it down because y'all need to know that. The paradox of it, it even works on your business. You all that yes. have businesses. You did the, the, that whole mindset. Just because you in charge 
don't mean that you have to be abusive. You can get you can get more done in your business as an entrepreneur if you understood how to make people feel like they're a partner in the mountain. Yes. Just as God does with us. We're a partner, we co-partner with him to fulfill his plan for the world, for salvation, for the kingdom of God. So it's the same thing. And particularly, you know, the greatest joy, I think, for leadership is when you see the people who are following you, when you help them emerge into leadership, just as Christ did. That's something that we should always be thinking about. Make as we elevate, they should be elevating with us. No one should ever be left behind unless they just, some people just don't want to be leaders. But those who do, find ways to help them develop and grow. Take them to the next level. Wow, she done dropped, the, she done dropped another nugget on y'all that I hope y'all 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 picked up that leaders leave no one behind. That's a pop, I, I know it's simple, I know it sounds simple, but that was a very powerful point. Good leaders leave no one behind. No one behind. They try their best to bring everybody along. Now, of course, let me put some fly, let me put a fly in the ointment. Everybody, you can't pull along. Yes. And I'm gonna give you a prophetic word to put uh, in your in your in your notes. It comes from the prophet Dr. Spock on Star Trek. <laughs> he said, the knees of the many outweigh the knees of the few. Yes. That's the prophet Spock on the spaceship. He said, the knees of the many outweigh the knees of the few. So it has to be, has to be a balance. I don't want to leave anybody behind. I, I don't want to cause anyone to feel like that they're not valued or they don't have the proper gifting. But when it comes to the benefit of the whole, there are times as a leader, you have to be interested in the whole, right. the whole organization. How is it going to affect the whole organization? Because it, it only takes one person Yes. To negatively influence the yes. whole. That's why we got to make sure that you're not a disruptive leader negatively. And I'm going to find another word for disruption. I'm going to find another anonym for it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to find another anonym for it uh, so I can juxtapose it so you can see good disruption versus negative chaotic. And as we go deeper into it, we will talk about um, the historical context of the term and how it evolved. So you'll get a sense of the evolution yeah. of disruptive leadership and where we can even take it now into the future because it really is in its nascent stage. So I wanted to talk about um, the nature of leadership, just give some insight um, into the areas that focus that, you know, we focus on trait versus process. I'm sure a lot of you have heard these terms, um, appointed versus emergent, the concepts of power, coercion, management versus leadership. And trait really, it just delves into the innate qualities that you have. Bishop talked about that, you know, some people are born leaders, some they have the qualities, it's just instinctive, they know what to do. Versus the, you know, the process of the interacting that you have with leaders and followers. He does, we have this good about talking about the vocation of the people of God and that everybody has an opportunity to lead. Again, and even in your influence, that is a form of leadership, you know, so you have to see that as a, as a gift, that your integrity matters and how you influence matters. And you want to do it for the benefit, as Bishop said, and for the, the betterment of our community. When we talk about 
um, appointed, that's really like um, assigned. You may have instance, I know I have where, you know, um, particularly in, in ministry, where your, your leader will assign you to run an auxiliary or be over a project or something like that. Think about it from that perspective. That's really what we're talking about, assignments that we have, but we are assigned to lead. And a lot of them, in many instances, are a, what we would call stretch opportunities to stretch you so that you can grow in that particular area and your leader may see something in you and assign you to something and you don't really understand why but there's a rhyme and reason to it it enables you to learn and to master that area and prepares you for the next opportunity it helps you with decision making it helps you you know with um being creative it helps you with execution you're you're building your competencies so that's what that talks about, as well as the emergent piece of it, that that really delves into others, your peers, um, acknowledging your ability to lead and giving you space to do so. Then when we talk about um, the powers of, of the concepts of power, it's from two positions. One is the position, which is the title. And then the other one is personal. Again, it's talking about the follow the followers and how they view you and your you know how you your behavior around them. Coercion is force, right? We can look at um, at the I think it's what is it, Second Kings um, eleven, where she 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 was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Son died. And she wanted the throne. She was not the successor, but she forced her way in, right? And we know that that happens. It happens all the time where you see an opportunity or someone might see an opportunity. I won't say you, but, you know, people see opportunities. And we've experienced it. You see it and you go for it and you rally people around you to get that spot. Whether you should really have it or not, you want it. And, and I, I use the word you loosely, forgive me, that's just how I speak, but um, that's the kind of, of, of coercion that, of course, you know, we just can't tolerate, especially in this time and age that we're in. We need to make sure that the right people are in the right positions that particularly in this time can move us forward and where we need to be. Management is really about task, being task oriented. And then that leadership, again, we've talked about it about the influence. And then when you look at um, the nature of leadership from the perspective of God, we're looking at the fact that his attributes, attributes we know he's all knowing, he's all powerful, he's all seeing, he's everywhere. Those are attributes that he has as well as he's loving, he's kind, he's just. These are some attributes that we, we can wrap our minds around and we can emulate as well. Bishop, do you want to chime in at all? Share some insight on that? No, all I, I wanted to go back because I thought you I thought you did an excellent job, particularly on appointed versus emergent leadership. <laughs> I think you did a great job on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that's that that's listing page right there. Appointed uh, <laughs> Stretch opportunities. I think they need to look at that. They really need to write that down. Stretch opportunities. Uh, great leadership appoints you not to tasks that are easy for you, but they yes. put you in positions that all of your talent, all of your gifting is maximized. And uh, you can tell when you're an emergent leader because people around you do get a little agitated and irritated with you because you're you're going to use everything at your disposal you're not going to sit and wait for something to happen uh and you see this all the time particularly in church under my leadership is i put people in positions that do it I'm not going to look over your shoulder. Do it. Make it happen. And if you're a real leader, you're going to use everything at your disposal, your gifting, to make mm -hmm. sure things happen. It is my job as your leader 
to put you in positions that make you uncomfortable. You're not supposed to be comfortable if you're going to be a, a great leader. Great leadership is not about comfortability. It's really not. And I'm glad Doreen parked there. Now, the problem with that sometimes is uh, in that, 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 that third installment. And, and, <laughs> and I, I knew she was going to jump on it, but it's true. The concepts of power, the title, uh, position, coercion. Hey, we see that uh, all the time in, in leadership. People use their authority to coerce people into submission. It's not real leadership. It's not real influence. It's manipulation. It's yeah. coercion. And we have to be very, very careful of that. And then she talked about the management, uh, you know, that, that whole management piece, uh, management versus leadership. Some people are not great leaders, but they are great managers. They know how to structure. Yes. They know how to strategize. You got to know the difference between a great administrator versus a great leader. Right. You know, now there, there's room, I think Doreen would agree with me, uh, mm -hmm. and if she doesn't, she can push back. <laughs> uh, I think there's room for both, for yes. uh, the administrative style and also the influencer. I think that there, there's, there's room for both, because I think some influencers may not be great administrators. And you right. got some administrators that are not great influencers. So I think that there's some space that both can land and be effective. Because leaders are visionary. They have the vision, but they need others to help them carry it out. And another part of that is understanding and assessing your strengths, your competencies, where you are, you know, and knowing that it's okay to not be well-rounded. You don't have to have every competency to get the job done, but you do need to have people around you that have those skill sets and allow them to operate in them, you know, allow their giftings to be used as well. And also one other thing, um, don't be afraid to fail. That's how you learn. You know, failure sometimes is the best teacher. Nobody wants to fail, myself included. But it's the best teacher for me. When I go back and I assess what went wrong, how I could have done and date better, and sometimes I go to people who are experts and I get insight from them, and then I know if, if given the opportunity again, how to course correct and to move forward. But failure is definitely a part of the process. It's a part of growth in anything. When you learn how to walk, you're gonna fall down, get up, try it again, fall down, get up until you get your balance, get in your zone, get in your groove, and then you can move forward. And, and of course, you know, be, be successful and do what it is that you want to do or that you've been tasked with doing. Doreen, do me a favor. Go back to traits versus process leadership. I want you to go back to that real quickly, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, when we start talking about not being... Um, afraid to fail because a lot of people don't want to fail because they see that as um how can i say it? they see that they see themselves as a failure they see the event defining them as the person and that's not correct that's not correct that's not correct every great leader has has a list of events or projects that did not work. That makes them great leaders. When it doesn't work and you can find a way to regroup and be resilient. I use, mm -hmm. I use four terms and I think that they're going to be germane to our discussion going forward as it relates to uh, the trait versus process leader. Mm -hmm. uh, the creativity piece, being creative, being adaptive, being flexible, uh, and being reliable. 
you know, I think those those are uh, 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 character traits that 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 you people are not necessarily born with, but they certainly can be cultivated and developed. So, so do me a favor, explain traits versus process leadership again. So I'll give you the the definitive trait is about innate qualities that you have. We have a lot of properties that we possess in varying degrees by different people, but it resides, they say, in select people. But I believe that it can be, you can develop those skill sets versus the process, which really is about the interaction that you have with leaders and, uh, and followers and how you, that, in, that engagement is what it talks about. It's the difference between, and I would even add, Bishop, to what you said um, about failure in the laundry list. Um, I remember when uh, Bishop Figueroa talked about sharing that, the, the failure with those who were close to him. Sometimes we need to be transparent as leaders and really say, you know, yeah, I messed, I failed at this. I didn't do well, you know, um, and what I learned from it. We have to be transparent because we give off this, this image of success that is really not realistic. And when you have people coming up in ministry under you, they need to really see what it, it, what it entails in its entirety, totality, rather. Um, because that will help them grow, right? That will give them a sense of balance and that will give them the resilience, as you mentioned, that they need to persevere That's right. and not give up. That's right. And I think people tend, and, and you gotta stay away from this, and I, I, know, I know we're drilling into it, but we need to drill into that. I think sometimes people have this attitude that uh, because you fail, if you, if you express your failure, if you expose your failure, then you become defined by that. Or people see that as your character and your disposition, and that not, is not necessarily the truth. You, just because you fail, that does not define you as the person. Right. But you can help others, you can help others being transparent. Now here's the issue, transparency should never be used as coercion. Yes, yes. Can't do that. See, a lot of times we got these psychologically slick leaders that are transparent in order to continue to coerce people into doing things that they should not do. It becomes it becomes a, a, a ambiguous way of controlling people. Or it can also be used as a way for you not to hold me accountable right. as a leader. Because if I'm already telling you, listen, now y'all know I'm low down, right? I'm telling y'all now, I'm low down. I'm as low as low can be. When I do something low down, you are not shocked because I call myself being transparent and being open when I was really coercing your emotions. I was hijacking your emotions and manipulating it. Instead of being accountable saying, yes, I messed up, this is where I messed up, and these are, these are these, this is what I put in place for me not to revisit that behavior, instead of reinforcing that behavior by continuing to do it, that is coercion. And that is what Athaliah did. I'm glad uh, Doreen brought, brought, brought her up. I'm glad she brought her up because, she, well, you know what? That goes back to what I said. That was innate in her DNA because her daddy was Ahab, mm -hmm. her mama was Jezebel. So she couldn't do nothing but be uh, a manipulator and, and someone that had a thirst for power. And when it came time for her 
to relinquish the power instead of her relinquishing it she killed everybody around yeah, her. You see, the royal court sure did that, that that's important of what doreen is saying we have after liars that want title and they will kill everybody around with their influence in order to maintain that power that's dangerous you see it on your secular job all the time the person in power or the person that is the supervisor uses their influence to kill everybody else around them that can emerge to a position of leadership that's dangerous that's dead that's very dangerous and you don't want that to be called that type of leader Ahead, conversely so you have that type of leader, then you also have someone who is new to, to, or appointed again, as we talked about, like Saul, where he was, as he said, the least of the tribe of Benjamin, right? And Jacob said he would be a ravenous wolf. And when the people of Israel went to Samuel and said, you know, we want a king, it was predicated upon the fact that they wanted something tangible because the nations around them had tangible kings and they wanted the same. And God said, okay, I'm gonna give it to you, but this person is going to take from you. He's not gonna make you better. It's gonna make you worse. And you, if you go to Samuel 8, you'll read about it. And it's like five or six times God says, he's gonna take, he's gonna take your land. He's gonna take your grain. He's gonna take your, vi on your, your vineyards. He's gonna take everything. He's gonna take your, peop your, your daughters, your sons, and put them to work. Saul had this image of himself. You know, it talks about how he was appointed, Samuel had, or had anointed him, and he's hiding with the baggage, right? Not comfortable with this new role that he's going to be in, then gets into the role and gets, you know, goes from powerless to powerful but doesn't use that power appropriately. But God told them that this was going to happen. And it did, you know, um, but they still wanted it. They still wanted that person. So that's even just another perspective of sometimes we think the person that is, is you know, as, as um, when you talk about the process of leaders and followers and, and we put them in those roles, sometimes even just as peers, we allow, we, we appoint someone to be the leader and that really isn't the person that should be. Sometimes it just needs to be an organic thing where, you know, you don't have a title. Like Mark Sanborn says, you don't need a title to lead. Sometimes everybody just has to have their place, right? But I, I love how um, Saul is the antithetical description to what leadership should not be, right? He's the, uh, you know, God is, we have, we talked about God and the type of leadership that he demonstrated and God was careful to, to make sure that we were all taken care of. Saul so moved away from the communal living model that God had established where everybody, based on, on um, Joshua, everyone had an inheritance. They all worked together in community for the common goal, for the common good. Then Saul gets appointed, no experience whatsoever, maybe no frame of reference, and now becomes this person that um, is not what, what Israel needs. And then if you look down in the lineage, you go into the kings, you see that he sets the tone for what happens throughout their history moving forward. See, that, that, that point that Doreen brought out it, 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 it shouldn't be combed over. And she brought it out so eloquently. Samuel 8, you need to write that down because she gives us the traits of leadership that is inexperienced, leadership that is one-sided, leadership that has its own agenda, yes. leadership that is just highly, uh, he's egomaniacal. You know, but but I, I think I think I, I don't I don't know how me and Doreen can explain it to you. I think we create these Sauls. Yes. We we we, we, we create them. Uh because see Saul can't Saul can't create himself. 
<laughs> we create the saws. We, 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 we have to be the ones who take responsibility for putting the saws in the office based on how they look. Because yes. the Bible says Saul had a particular overt look. It never talks about his character that's intrinsic talked about he was handsome, he was head and shoulders above the rest, but Samuel tried to tell him, okay, hey, y'all sure y'all want this? Because see, when I read this text, I, 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 really, I, really, I really somewhat struggle with it because, you know, it, it's, 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 it's like God says, give them what they want. Give them the type of leadership they think they want. Give them Donald Trump. They, they're going to vote for Donald Trump. Give them, give them number 45. That's what they want. Give them that type of leader. And this is so powerful. And we did not plan on even going down this road. We agree. But if you look at the traits of Saul, they mirror Donald Trump. Yes, they do. If you look at the traits, uh, come on, y'all, 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 research it for yourself. If you look at the traits of Saul, they mirror Donald Trump. It looks just like number 45 when you start reading. I mean, you start reading some of the stuff. Uh, oh, my God. It, what he would take. He would take make you. male, female slaves. He yes. would do this. He would do that. I mean, he was only concerned about himself, you know, tweeting all night long. That's Saul. That's Saul right there. But that's the type of leadership that they thought they wanted being like other nations. And sometimes we look at other companies and we look at other uh, uh, corporate entities and because we're on the outside looking, outside looking in, we say, oh, that's, that's, that's the model. That's what I want. That would be perfect mm -hmm. leadership structure for me, uh, my business, and my, 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 my ministry until you put that in place and you find out the construct of it is a Saul construct. Yes. And you don't want a Saul construct. Because you're on the outside looking in. That's right. You don't know how it was built, why it was built, you know. And so, it, that again, it just is so important to really seek God and ask him to give you the wisdom and the knowledge to be the leader, to build the foundation for what is to come. So I want to, if you don't mind, let's transition just to give you some approaches to leadership for you to think about, I'm going to share eight with you. And um, if you don't, you want to take notes, you can. I'm just going to read off. So authentic leadership, there really is no definition for it, right? They argue over what it is. It's not agreed upon. But it really is about focusing on authenticity of the leader and the follower. And it really focuses on being a leader being trustworthy. Some examples of that biblically might be Paul and Titus. Adaptive leadership um, urges followers to adapt as they confront and solve problems. We're facing that right now. We have adaptive leaders who have been able to, Bishop yourself included, to be, be able to adapt to the environment from being in the house of worship to now being online. And they're encouraging. Servant leadership, everyone is familiar with that. We think it's um, biblical, but Robert Greenleaf actually didn't have that in mind when he was talking about, and he defined servant leadership. But he says he places the leader in a servant role. So you are servant first. We also hear that, you know, we always say in the scripture that Jesus was a servant. That's an example of that. And adaptive, I would say Moses is one example that you could reference. Transformational leadership is about creating a connection through engagement, with others that raises the level of motivation and morality in both. This type of leader attends to the needs and motives of followers, so it's follower-centric, and helps them reach their full potential, what we talked about earlier. Some examples definitely of that is Jesus. 
Charismatic leadership is about influence. House talked about it being synonymous with transformational leadership and they act in unique ways that have specific char char um, charismatic effects on their followers. Um, I think David, it, it fall, he falls under that umbrella. Transactional leadership is self-serving. It's based on an exchange between the leader and the follower. And the transactional leader does not individualize the needs of the followers or focus on their personal development. They exchange things of value with followers to advance their own and the, and the followers' agenda. Influence is not genuine as followers do not feel like they have a choice. And I'm going to talk about Solomon when we, as we delve deeper into that. I use Solomon and Ahab in those, those examples. Spiritual leadership is really about motivation. It focuses on the values, the calling, and the ability to motivate followers. And I like Peter as my example for that. You can, of course, select your own. The last one is situational leadership. And that's probably the oldest theory besides the great man theory. And it focuses on the belief that the demands of situations require different leadership at different times. We can, you know, there's a plethora of individuals, both biblically and secularly, that we can um, talk about that have, they that, um, exhibit the situational leadership approach. And, and it's really about being adaptive. So what I did, you know, I know it's a lot of information and what I, I'm probably going to try to do is create a slide um, with a lot of this information and I'll see if we can post it online for you all so you'll have it. But this is just a summary of what the roles are. I talked about eight different leadership theories and there are more. These are just like the, the primary, primary leadership theories that you'll hear a lot about um, you hear people, pastors say, I'm a charismatic, or someone else might say they're a charismatic leader and they're transformational. These are the ones that they focus on. And each one, the, the, um, the type of behavior that's exhibited at a high level, I wanted to share this all with you. So if you want to just um, take a photo of it to have it, please feel free to do so. These are the roles, um, again, that you're looking for in in leadership and and when someone says it like I, I had an instance where um someone professed to be a servant leader and um i didn't have a frame of reference at that point uh three four years later i'm baffled that she even sees herself in that vein because her form of leadership has a trail of blood behind her and servant leadership is about you know putting the the follower first they're supposed to leave you better than when they came right the trail of blood is not leaving you better than when i came right so you know it's, it's amazing how people will see themselves in a in a certain light but their actions their behaviors and the end result of their engagement speaks volumes and so you have to look at that and that's why i want it to share this with you because I think it is important to really understand at a, again at a very high level what some of these um, the, the behaviors are and, and it, again you can go online all of this information is available online for you to just you know if you are interested in learning more about one of the the theories you can definitely do it I go online I mean I you know I've studied it but I also go online really just to see what's out there, what people are saying about, what the voices are saying about it at that time. So even just in thinking, um, lastly on this, leadership in action, if you wanted to go to scripture, you could look at Joseph or Esther, right, during their time. And then present day crossover, again, we talk about John Lewis just because he's been, um, his, his life, and legacy is so prominent now. We're learning so much about him. And there's so many more moving forward that are out there. You know, Bishop has brought some in on panel discussions that are out there doing the work. 
leaders in ministry, leaders as activists, they're all out there. Find your place in that, in that particular setting. I think that when you look at these eight leadership styles, you should be able to find your, you should land somewhere. And then you gotta be honest. I think a lot of people wanna think they're a servant leader, they serve first. And I think that's a mischaracterization many times <laughs> of, of, of your leadership style. I would, I would fathom to say that most of the people that I've had the benefit of pastoring um, are very situational. Mm -hmm. They adapt. They, 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 when I say adapt, they adapt good and they adapt bad. They, they adapt, uh, I think, when you look at spiritual, they're motivating in the moment. Uh, when we're in church or when we're in sacred space or when we're serving as community, I can see them being, uh, you know, motivating because that's, that's, that's the climate that has and and the atmosphere that has been fostered through worship through the preaching of the word but outside of that space outside of that venue they don't have much motivation going on so that 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 i don't think i don't think that that i pastored a lot of people like that i think the ones i pastored hmm, <laughs> uh, very situational, uh, situational at best. Uh, and I think, you know, adaptive, I see a lot of adaptive, you know, they, they, they encourage, but th that to me, that can be a little bit, that, that can be a little bit dangerous when you're encouraging people and you're not making people accountable. Right. You know, you're always, reinforcing them with with celebration oh you were so wonderful oh you did this so great oh i just love you oh you, you always pat them on their back but you know they're not make being, them better they're not being better they're not being transformed unfortunately in my in my experience people are situational and they'll say stuff like, I'll be with you through the thick and through the thin, but when it gets thick, most of the time they thin out. That's situational. You can't be a situational leader that just adapts to the environment. There is a place for that. It is a place for that where you may not agree with the leader, but you will adapt to what is going on in order to make it better, not adapt uh, yes. to sit there and just see how it evolves or how it organically develops, but you adapt to make it better. I think, uh, and maybe Doreen can chime in on this, uh, that I think the transactional leader is, is rather dangerous. The transactional leader is rather dangerous. I think what we should be looking for is maybe authentic, uh, uh, servant, transformation, maybe charisma. I think those are the leadership styles that basically are more dominant, more yes. dominant in, in a religious setting. Maybe not a secular setting, but in a religious setting, I think those leadership styles uh, that leadership role is more prominent. What you need to get a good working definition uh, of all eight of them, like she said, there's over 200. But I think these eight, these eight give us a good framework to understand where you may fall in your leadership style or your leadership mentality or as you emerge as a leader, what's, what's going to be your strength or what may be your weakness. So I think looking at all eight is very, very important. Very, and very important. You can be more than one. Yes. Right? You can involve over time, right? So that 
if you don't mind, Bishop, I think that's a great segue into the challenge that we have. We yes. Can challenge with them. And so we put together this challenge for you. It, no obligation if you want to do it. You know, I think it would be helpful is something, again, when I'm consulting with emerging leaders or even in my workplace when I'm working with leaders, um, this is part of what I do with coaching. The self-assessment is everything. So we've learned a lot. want you then to now identify your approach to leading. And just jot something down, you know, it doesn't have to be more than like a paragraph, but include the behaviors that you think are resident within you and defend why you believe it's so. And then what you would do and what, again, I encourage people to do when I'm working with them is I say, now you need to go get some feedback because you think that, you know, I can think that I'm, I'm a charismatic leader, but it's nice to hear what other people think about my leadership style, to get that input. And Jesus asked his disciples, he said, who do the crowd say that I am? And then he asked them, and who do you say that I am, right? So that's a part of that feedback. You know, we can use that scripture as a model to go out and ask someone maybe in a senior level that's over you, um, your peer, you know, direct reports, family, whomever you feel comfortable with asking these questions. What type of leader do you think I am? And again, you're not going to share it with them. I wouldn't go and say, Bishop, I think I'm a charismatic leader. What do you say? I'm going to go to Bishop and say, you know, Bishop, tell me what type of leader do you think I am? How do you think I might be more effective as a leader? What ways do I need to develop? And I encourage you to just listen, take notes and listen. And then go and assess what you've heard versus and compare. Look for themes that the outliers that stand out, the things that, that are common through the thread of the conversations and the areas where you can develop and, and begin to think about. You don't have to do it. You, it's, we're not asking you to come back next week with this filled out. This is just something that I think is so beneficial. I've done it for myself. And again, when I'm working with clients, I do the same thing. It's good to come up with a plan. And, you know, I have an accountability partner who has been with me for the past eight years. She has held me up in terms of holding me accountable for the things that I say in terms of my development and my growth, the things that I want to do. It's good to have a trusted advisor that you can share that with you know, and they see it as a gift of you sharing your, your most vulnerable self in terms of what you want to do with, to develop as a leader, but then they will help you and partner with you through that process. So if you're interested, again, um, you want to take a screenshot of it. It's the fastest way I do it all the time when I'm, I'm learning. Take a screenshot of this. We encourage you to really begin thinking about leadership and think about it from a future perspective. What type of leader do you need to be for the world that we're going to be in five, 10 years from now, God spare our lives? What type of leadership does the ministry, is the ministry going to need? We're looking at technology, digital transformation. We're now moving to platforms. So many things are, going to, are going to change. So what type of leaders Will the church, will ministry lead, will education lead, will healthcare lead moving forward? And then begin to create your, your action plan. Yeah, I think it's, it's important, write the vision and make it plain. Write the vision, make it plain. Read it so you know what direction you want to go in. I think this week's challenge is one that everyone should attempt to embrace and to take. And I want you to be very honest about it. Be honest about what people uh, see in you in terms of leadership. Now, of course, don't, 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 don't ask people that are enamored with you, that are impressed with you. Yes. That, that don't, 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 don't get with people that give you a false, a false scale of balance. Get with someone that's going to be uh, honest. And, and, and I'm going to give you this one for free. 
This is this is for, this is a free revelation I'm giving to you. I, I I haven't shared it with the world yet, but I'm gonna share it with you all. Don't take advice from people that you're not willing to critique you. I don't talk. I don't take advice from nobody that I'm not in relationship with. I have relationships with people. Those people, I allow them to critique me. I'm not going to take a critique from anyone that I don't have a relationship with. Get, get with relationships right. that you trust, that's going to be honest with, about your nasty disposition, about your posture, about your, how you think. Don't give me, oh, you're wonderful. No, get with somebody to say, yeah. you know, you could have did this better. Why don't you try this? Why don't you read this? I see you as this lead. Because see, a lot of people think they're friendly, but they're only friendly to themselves. Get, get with people that don't mind being very brutally honest with you. It's only going to make you better. You should want constructive criticism. Now, that's one thing I'll say that I find uh, very disheartening in, in church and in leading church people. And I've experienced it even this week. Uh, uh, Bishop, I want to tell you something. I want to, I want to, I want to say this to you, but I'm afraid that if I say something to you about it, uh, that I'll be vilified or I'll look like, uh, I'm not a part of the team or I look like I'm not with it. Uh, so, I'm not going to say nothing, but Bishop, I'll tell you, but you have to please, Bishop, don't tell, don't tell them that I told you this. You cannot be an effective leader and afraid to articulate what you feel and what you see. You have to be able to articulate it, even when it's uncomfortable. Uh, and you and, and as a leader, you don't throw people under the bus. You don't do that. You wear it. If you're a team, you wear it. Everything that went wrong this week in the virtual experience is my fault. It is nobody else's fault. It's my fault because I am the leader. Well, Bishop, you didn't know X1. I didn't have to know. I'm the leader. I'm in charge. When people look for leadership, they should look for the person that's able to wear that, that doesn't mind saying, okay, put it on me. No problem. I did it. I was wrong. I'll make it better the next time. Uh, and, and I think when you look at the challenge, you know, and that accountability partner, uh, uh, I, I, I know Doreen is telling the truth because we've talked about this. She has, she has a person that, that keeps her to the task. Doreen, you said you were going to do this. Why isn't this done? You need to have people if you're going to be an effective leader. You're going to be an effective leader. You cannot have people that change the rules and regulations as is comfortable for you. You have to have people that keep you held to a particular standard, all right? I yeah, love no. you enough to want to do it. That's right. And that's, that's an amazing part of it. She loves me enough to speak truth to me. Even when she knows I don't want to hear it, she tells it to me anyway. And that has helped me to grow. It's helped me to grow. So the last thing we want to share with you, and for some reason, I don't know why there's writing on it, but Cause I don't, I'm sorry. I don't know where this, the, the writing piece of it came from, but, um, I, some books. I put it on your slide, but I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I it's think I put that on your slide. I'll take the hit. I put it on there. I did something crazy. You know me. I, 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 I'm trying to work with this thing, being creative and I'm white. Like I'm a little child, right? <laughs> okay. Share with you. I can't, I can't. I'm going to teach you graphic design after that. The, the prophet did it. <laughs> I was like, where is this coming from? And I'm, I'm moving everything around on my computer trying to figure out how to do it. And the it was you. God did it. The man of God. You. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to be creative. I'm trying to do this here. And the man of God writing all over here like a little child. Go ahead, Pop. Go ahead, Pop. <laughs> 
three books at the end of each um, session. We're going to share some books with you that, and then I even encourage you all, if you know of a book, you can put it in the chat for the next session or even today. But these are just some books that have, have really um, inspired me. We want to share them with you. And they, you know, some of them may be from a spiritual lens, some may be from a secular lens, but I think you can always learn something. Um, you can always take that nugget and, and use what you can from it to, to add that to your action plan and move it forward. So like I said, at the end of each session, we'll have some books for you. They may vary, but um, if you have other books that you think might be of interest, please send them to me because I'm always looking for additional reading material and then I can share it with everyone else. And then with that, Bishop, do you want to just talk about what we can expect and what um, we'll talk about next week? I'm sorry, we're talking about books. Hold on, Doreen. Frank, call me later, man. Good. Y'all excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, next week, we will, <laughs> we will be talking about, if y'all knew what my life entailed, I'd get, I'm getting calls from everybody. They know I'm in a session. Uh, next week, yes, next week, I don't want to mess up, I'm going to mess up again. Okay, next week, we're going to be dealing with historical antecedents of hegemony, and systemic oppression. We're going to go into watershed events, and we're going to talk about a leader's role in the seven mountains of culture. Now, uh, I didn't have time to do it this week, and I didn't get it to Doreen in time, but there's a book you need to get, uh, and it's called The Five Watersheds of Theology and historical data. Uh, the, the professor, uh, the writer is Dr. Dana Carson. I don't have my book in front of me. I didn't get it to Doreen because she would have put it into the uh, presentation. But next week, I'll have, uh, we have a picture of the book. It's one that I would suggest along with the other prescribed readings that you get in order, particularly to understand when we go into watershed events. Yes. Uh, watershed events that, that, that shape leadership through colonialism, yes. post-colonialism, watersheds, of, of, particularly in the church, from the Roman, the European, the Western uh, Americanization, you, you need to understand those. And then you need to understand the leader's role in the seven mountains of culture. I think in one of my panel discussions, yeah. we added another mountain to it, but it's actually seven mountains. And you need to understand the role of a leader and your leadership style uh, in, in those mountains, all right? So we're gonna talk about that next week. Well, I think this was a great session. I put the link for the book in the, um, the chat for you, Bishop, if that's the right one. Let me see. Yes. yes thank you. That's it. that's it. Thank you, Frankie. You're welcome. Thank you so much. They need a picture, though. It's like me drawing on this slide. They need I can share my screen, Doreen. You will have to do it back, turn it back over. Okay, I tried to draw a picture. No, I got you. Hold on one second here. Uh, uh, Who's calling my name over there? Liam. Hey, Liam. Hi. Hold on one second here. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. Excellent that, book. Excellent. That's the excellent book. You need to get that book. That book will help you in ways that will blow your mind. It's an excellent, it's an excellent read. It has all the information that you could ever imagine, particularly about watersheds and explain what watersheds are. Uh, so, uh, but next week we'll be touching on this book along with the other items that we had listed. Um, now, what we what I, really back, want to, what I really want you to do is the exercises that we have come up with for you to do 
you need to, uh, you really need to consider doing those exercises. You will get a full benefit from these intensives if you do the exercise. That means over the next seven days, take some time out and go through the challenge. It's only going to help you, all right? It's not just enough to come on Saturday and hear us present it's better for you. It's more of a benefit. You'll, 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 be, you'll be stretched better if you uh, go through the material based on the exercises. And every week, we will have an assignment for you. All right? So look forward to the assignments. All right? Doreen, any other closing remarks before I let them go? Nope. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I appreciate it. I hope it was helpful. And thank you, Bishop. I appreciate you. Oh, no, I love you. Listen, this was, this was fantastic. I see Crystal over there clapping her hands, celebrating like she in church. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for supporting myself and Doreen. I, want, I really want to thank you. I want to thank you all for supporting myself and Tracy. Today is the yes. last day yes. of the prayer boot camp at 4 o'clock. Tracy's done an outstanding job, all right? And we have some more plans going forward with the prayer boot camp. Uh, I have to show y'all a note because I got everybody online. The men have been complaining to me, Doreen, that I have not put something together that's centered around men. So uh, uh, by tomorrow, you'll get another announcement and I'm setting up a platform of teaching just for the men, all right? So you all will get that uh, very quickly. I wanna thank also uh, Iris, who put together a tremendous uh, event for the women on last week. It was a tremendous success, and we're gonna be doing those things going forward. All right, listen, I gotta get to prayer. Y'all got to get to prayer too. Yes. 15 minutes, all right? I love you all, thank you so much. And I'll see you all later on today and, of course, tomorrow and next week, same time, next week, 10 a.m. I want to see you. God bless you. Have a great Thank day. Thank you all. Have a good Link day. Link is in the chat for those that want to uh, register for the Zoom this, uh, this evening at 4. And I have your email addresses, so I'll send out the information. All right. Thank you. Love you all. All right. Here we go.